Order, However, Senator McMahon. You will be in continuation when the date resumes. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Muriel Smith. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Today, before walking out of the chamber and turning his back on scrutiny of the Senate, the Minister referred to his management of aged care and, I quote, a high watermark. Last week, the Minister admitted that, and I quote, in some circumstances, we haven't got it right. Can the Minister tell us today what hasn't he got right? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator, for a question. Uh, Mr. Mr President, uh, I was very deliberate with what I said in my presentation to the Senate this morning. Uh, I have exact, uh, great respect for the processes of the Senate, and it's an important process that we follow here. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and, uh, and I have said, and the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, that there are some things that we haven't got right. Uh, and uh, we've quoted the example of the time when we had 24 hours to find a completely new staffing force in Basils in Melbourne, where things didn't happen uh, in the way that we hoped that they might, uh, Mr. President. Uh, so we've been very open with respect to those things. I have acknowledged in this place a number of times this week, and I did it again this morning, that I should have had the mortality numbers with me last Friday when I appeared before the Senate committee. I've, I've, I've admitted on, uh, and, and acknowledged that on a number of occasions, and I've apologised on a number of occasions quite appropriately, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, we've been very open about the circumstance in Victoria. Uh, we've continued to build the effort. We've continued to uh, build our response to ensure that Victorians in aged care get the, the quality of care that we've deserved. And the, and the proof of the pudding of that is in the results that we're seeing now in residential aged care facilities where we've actually improved the number of facilities that are on our red list from 13 a few weeks ago when we established the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre now to three. And Mr President, in my briefing this morning we had a only specifically had to have conversations about two of those. So, Mr. President, we continue to work in the interests of senior Australians, and that's exactly what we'll continue to do. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. When did the minister first realise he hadn't got it right? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, when the circumstances at St. Basil's occurred in the way that they did, it was clearly obvious to me that we didn't get it right, uh, and. Uh, if, 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 the, if, if, if the Senate would like to check the record, we acknowledge that very quickly. Uh, and we've con and that's why we've continued to build the response that we've built in Victoria, to ensure that we do provide a high quality of care to senior Australians. Point of order, Senator Cormann. These are important and sensitive matters, and the minister is doing his best to provide answers to the questions, and he's constantly interrupted by interjections. Interjections are always disorderly. Um, look, on the on the point of order, order on the point of order, interjections are always disorderly. Um, I, I, I generally apply the rule, as I do with questions, that the mood of the chamber is set by the questioner or the speaker. In this case, I would say both the questioner and the speaker are actually speaking in a rather respectful manner, uh, and therefore it is not an appropriate time to be somewhat more boisterous. Um, so I just remind senators of the standing orders, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, Mr. President, we will continue to work towards the best interest of uh, Victorian aged care residents in conjunction with the Victorian government, which we've done very cooperatively, uh, particularly since we've been able to establish the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, which has brought together, as I said this morning, the decision-making processes of the Victorian health system uh, and the national aged care system uh, to make sure that resources are available. Uh, for the appropriate care of, of residents in aged care facilities that have COVID-19 outbreaks within them. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. This week, the minister has boasted that despite more than 360 deaths in aged care, he has responded incredibly well, that we are in a relatively good position and extremely fortunate, and today referred to his handling as a high watermark. Why is this minister more focused on self-congratulation than getting it right? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, um, Mr. President uh, the opposition uh, continue to mis Again. misstate 
my comments uh, and twist them and use them in a way that I did not utter them, Mr. President. And, and quite frankly, the, the practice is, is, is dishonest, Mr. President. The practice is dishonest. Order, Mr. Senator President. Wong, on point of order. Uh, I take it well. I'd ask the minister to withdraw dishonest. Those are direct quotes. Um, Senator Cormann, on uh, point of order. On the point of order, the minister is absolutely right that uh, the way his statements are taken out of context is dishonest. Um, it is not. Um, that term is not unparliamentary. It's not for the chair, nor is it appropriate for me to begin ruling on matters of interpretation such as that. Um, it is not unparliamentary language, so I, cannot, uh, I won't be asking the minister to withdraw. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The Labor Party this week have consistently taken my comments out of context in a deliberate attempt to portray what I've said in a different way. Mr. Mr. President, as I said earlier, I was very deliberate with my comments this morning. Very, very deliberate with my comments. And, and, and our circumstance in an international context is so much better than those overseas. So much better. Now it doesn't mean, Mr. President, that doesn't mean that the circumstances here are difficult, that the circumstances here aren't tragic, and that the deaths that have been suffered uh, are anything but tragic, Mr. President. It doesn't mean any of those things. Uh, but I am not Order, going Senator to. Senator Colbeck. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government is protecting and advancing Australia's interests by ensuring a consistent foreign policy? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson for his question and his interest uh, in particular in this issue. It is vital that Australia and all levels of government in Australia speak with one voice in our dealings with other countries. The Australian people expect and deserve that. That's why this government will introduce the Australia's Foreign Relations Bill 2020. The bill will require states and territories to consult the foreign minister on arrangements with foreign governments and other entities. The scheme will establish an approval regime and a notification regime. Both regimes apply to proposed and to existing arrangements. If they are proposed, the foreign minister is able to declare that they not proceed. If they are already in place, the foreign minister is able to declare that they are not valid. States or territories wanting to make an arrangement with a national government of another country or one of that government's departments or agencies will be required to notify and receive approval from the foreign minister. If a state or a territory wants to make an arrangement with a foreign entity, such as another state or province or a local government, the state or territory must notify the foreign minister. The foreign minister's approval in these instances just mentioned is not required. However, the foreign minister does have discretion to declare that they are invalid or that they not proceed if inconsistent with foreign policy. <coughs> These laws will ensure that, as a nation, we are consistent in how we deal with the world and that we are all taking a national perspective in our national interest. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister inform the Senate about the test that will apply under the Australian Foreign Relations Bill 2020 to arrangements by states and territories with foreign governments? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. The legislation will provide a framework for the Commonwealth to measure state and territory arrangements against established foreign policy. The test is whether the foreign minister is satisfied that an arrangement or its negotiation does not adversely affect Australia's foreign relations or is unlikely to do so, and is not inconsistent with Australians, Australia's foreign policy or is unlikely to be so. If the minister is not satisfied, he or she will have to refuse approval or may declare an existing arrangement to be invalid or may declare that negotiations not be continued. Subsidiary arrangements entered into under the auspices of an invalid arrangement may also be invalidated. Mr President, for transparency, the, Foreign, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade will also be maintaining a publicly accessible register of decisions. Senator Patterson, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate why this bill is necessary? Senator Payne. Mr. President, the government has identified from an open source search at least 135 arrangements between states and territories and foreign governments across 30 countries. 
We can't say with certainty how many more there are, a fact that underscores why this bill is necessary. To date, there's been no requirement that states and territories consult with the Commonwealth on these arrangements and therefore no opportunity for Commonwealth expertise to be applied, that is, the work of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in particular. We don't want to impede business links. We don't want to impede people-to-people -people links. As an outward-looking trading nation, Australia wants those relationships. We benefit from them. Rather, the legislation will give state and territory governments confidence that they are acting in a way that serves Australia's national interests and assure Australians that we are exercising due diligence in our international engagements. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. How is it that the Minister's strongest defence for the failure to listen to the warning of Dorothy Henderson Lodge is, as I quote, we talked. Why did the minister fail to listen to this warning and take real action to ensure the events at Dorothy Henderson Lodge were not repeated? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I wouldn't agree with what uh, Senator Sheldon has just said, Mr. President, because we we actually we actually did uh, start very quickly implementing issues that we that raised at Dorothy Henderson Lodge. So, Mr. President, one of the things that we saw at Dorothy Henderson Lodge, and I actually have answered this question before in question time earlier this week, Mr. President, is that uh, we, we very quickly learnt the issues around workforce. And at Dorothy Henderson Lodge, we didn't at that point in time have our surge workforce um, provisions in place, and we had to rely on some uh, some uh, capacity from New South Wales Health, which they provided. But within a week of Dorothy Henderson Lodge, we actually did lodge. We actually did have our surge workforce processes in place, Mr. President. Our contracts were in place very quickly. So, as as I've said, and I said this morning, as this pandemic has progressed, as we've learned things that we need to address, we've continued to do that, Mr. President. And uh, so, Mr. President, uh, we, we actually did put surge workforce into place. We announced the 101 million dollars on the 11th of March, Mr. President, which was. Um, which was only seven days after the Dorothy Henderson Lodge uh, outbreak commenced. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Uh, Senator Ferravanti Wells, former Shadow Minister for Ageing, has said, and I quote, the Aged Care Sector Committee has effectively only been a talk fest committee, with little progress made over the years since it was established in 2014. Did the minister fail to listen to the warning of Dorothy Henderson Lodge and take real action because the Morrison government is all talk and no action? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr President, um, I think for, for uh, Senator Sheldon to uh, try and diminish the work that's being done by people who are serving the sector, uh, I think is unfortunate, Mr President. I think is unfortunate. Uh, and, uh, Mr. President, Order. one of the reasons that we called a royal commission was we wanted to have a forensic look at the entire sector. Uh, and if uh, Senator Sheldon had been watching the, lo lo the royal commission closely, he would have seen that one of the questions that the royal commission is actually asking us is the relationship between the sector and government. And I think it's a very appropriate question. So I support the, the comments of. Um, uh, Senator Fever Andy Wells in that context, because the relationship between the sector and government is, is an extremely important one. So uh, I look forward to the recommendations of the Royal Commission in that sense, Mr. President. And I don't agree with Senator Sheldon with respect to the circumstances that came out of Dorothy Order, Henderson Lodge. Senator Colbeck, time for the answers expired. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. The Morrison Cabinet failed to listen to the interim report of the Royal Commission entitled Neglect. The warnings from the Northern Hemisphere, the warnings from experts and unions, the warnings of Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and New March House in April. How many of the more than 360 older Australians who have died in aged care would be alive if this minister had done more than just taught? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, well, I clearly reject the premise of the question that uh, Senator Sheldon's just put, because this government has continued to act and, and build its response to the COVID-19 pandemic 
in aged care as uh, that response has required to be grown, Mr. President. And I've I have mentioned that in a number of times during this week, so I reject the premise of the question put to me by Senator Sheldon. Uh, we have, and I have seen those actions put into place every single day uh, as I have worked alongside health officials, officials from the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre and, Vic and the officials from the uh, caseworker team that look after every facility that has a COVID-19 outbreak. We have consistently looked at the circumstances that have come from every other facility. We have looked at what we might learn. We have looked at what we might do differently. We consistently ask ourselves what we might do differently. We have acted, Mr President, on the advice of the HPPC and the health professionals to ensure that we do uh, the best that we can provide order, for Senator Austra senior Colbeck. Australians. We will be going online to order. Um, can I remind senators just to, just to be quiet during the question because sometimes we don't have the best volume. Senator Steele, John. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General. Uh, Minister, the Disability Royal Commission has been running since September of 2019, and many people and organisations have made submissions and shared their stories. However, there is a large group of disabled people who have not and cannot, because the Commission cannot currently guarantee their protection and confidentiality beyond the life of the Commission. One person in particular springs to mind, a woman who is right at the beginning of her educational career, has suffered discrimination in that career, including in the school that she now works. She tells me that she will not tell her story until she can be uh, assured that it won't in itself end her career. Will the Attorney General apologise to people who have not been able to tell their stories because of his failure to act and do what he has been promising to do, which is introduce these protections to Parliament, which he, has been, uh, which he has known about the need for since February of this year. The Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Steelejohn for his, uh, his question. Uh, Senator, uh, I will take the issues that you have raised on notice uh, to the Attorney General and seek advice from him in response to those. Senator Steelejohn, a supplementary question. Thank you. Disabled people, our families and our organisations have been urging the government to introduce privacy protections to guarantee safety and, con and confidentiality of submissions. The issue was flagged last November by the chair of the commission and in February he did write formally to the government. After months of advocacy, it was believed that the government is intending to introduce uh, legislation during the next sitting week of parliament. Can the Attorney General confirm the intention to introduce this legislation in the next sitting week? Senator Payne. Mr President, uh, as I advised Senator Steelejohn earlier, I don't have this uh, detailed information with me. I will most certainly take it on notice and return to the chamber as soon as possible with that advice, Senator. Senator Steelejohn, a final supplementary question. Uh, on page 37 of the Royal Commission's second progress report, the chair noted that the limitations of confidentiality are impeding uh, people's willingness to give evidence and therefore affecting the scope of the Commission's work. We are now a year into a process that was meant to take three years in total, and the issue has not been resolved. Does the Attorney General acknowledge that his failure to act has served as an impediment? to disabled people telling our stories to our commission. Senator Payne. Um, Mr President, uh, I thank Senator Steelejohn for the further supplementary. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the Attorney General is considering matters relating to uh, confidentiality protections. Uh, certainly any information provided to the Royal Commission is protected while the inquiry continues. Uh, but I, as I said, Senator Steelejohn, and I apologise that I don't have the detail to your specific questions uh, with me here in the chamber today, will take it on notice and I will return to the chamber as soon as possible with that advice for you. Senator Walsh. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. According to Mr Morrison, Kalina Care notified the Department of Health it had a positive COVID-19 outbreak on 27 July, and testing of residents and staff commenced the next day. On what date was the testing of all residents and staff completed? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbert. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I don't have a detailed brief on time of each of the testing cycles, Mr President, because what, what happens with when an outbreak is advised? We send uh, 
uh, a first responder nurse in immediately to assess the site, and we also send our sonic teams in to commence testing both residents and staff. But, Mr. President, because not all staff are rostered on the same day and they come in over cycles, sometimes it does take a couple of days to complete the, t the testing of all the staff. Mr. President. So I'm very happy to bring that information back to the chamber. I think it's a, it's a fair question, it's an appropriate question, but I don't have the detailed uh, information with respect to the testing cycles of all the staff members and when that information has come back. Mr. President. I'm happy to pr provide that on notice to the chamber. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. In the same answer, the Prime Minister said a surge workforce was provided to Kalina Care on 31 July. Who was staffing Kalina Care from 27 July until the surge workforce was provided four days later? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President, uh, when the outbreak first occurred uh, and when the epidemiology of the outbreak was being undertaken, uh, the, the facility was providing its own staffing until it, it came to a stage where there had been enough that be, had been f that uh, we understood who needed to be uh, who tested positive, who what the staff shortages were, and, assessment, and the, the assessments of the site had been completed. And so that process started on day one. Uh, the close contacts were tracked and traced uh, of of the initial staff member, uh, and as the understanding, Mr. President of the, who the close contacts were, who the, who the positive staff members were. Staff were progressively furloughed from the site uh, and the surge workforce was, was brought in to compensate uh, for the loss of staff through the uh, furloughing of, of those people. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. How many staff and how many residents at Kalina Care tested positive to COVID-19 in the four days between 27 July and 31 July. Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President, I don't have the list of the initial testing, Mr. President, because my understanding of what occurred at that site was that there was a progressive uh, testing of positives over a period of time, which is the, a function of COVID-19, Mr. President. It, different people incubate at different times, and so uh, there has been a progressive growth in the number of a progressive growth in the number of positives in both staff and residents, uh, purely, Mr. President, because of the function of the virus. Uh, people don't incubate at the same rate, Mr. President. So, uh, Senator Pratt. So, Mr. President, uh, it may be that you're tested today and test negative, and two days later, which is the cycle under which we test, so we test every 72 hours, Mr. President. Uh, they might not, they not, might not test positive for the second, to the second or third test, given that there's an incubation period of up to 14 days for COVID-19, Mr. President. Um, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Vote, Mr. President, I would ask that the minister do the right thing and come in at the end of question time to answer the three questions he was unable to answer. I think that would be a courtesy to the chamber. Um, Senator, uh, we're going online again. Senator Hanson. Uh, I think you're on mute, Senator Hanson. All right, can you yep. see me now? Yep, all good. All right, thank you, thank Senator Hanson. My question is for the Treasurer, um, to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gorman. Um, today's paper announced the government's intention to introduce legislation to unwind new and existing agreements between a foreign power and state government, local councils, and or universities when they are not in the national interest, giving this power to the Foreign Affairs Minister. The Australian people have seen our current Prime Minister approve the sale of Australia's largest dairy farm, Moon Lake, in Tasmania to the Chinese when he was the Treasurer. Also, the former Trade Minister, Andrew Robb, is now working for the Chinese company Landbridge, who bought the Port of Darwin on a 99-year lease. How do you intend to instill confidence in the Australian people and myself that the national interest will come before possible self-interest or the United Nations and free trade agreements? Senator, Senator Cormann. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, the Australian government is responsible to make judgments when it comes to the national interest on our foreign affairs. And, uh, and of course, the Australian government has the authority to determine what is in our national interest based uh, on our uh, democratic system. 
It is the Australian people ultimately who determine who gets to make uh, those judgments on behalf uh, of, our, of our nation. Uh, Australians rightly expect uh, the Australian government, th the Australian government they elect, to set foreign policy. A primary focus of um, our government has been protecting and promoting the national interest. Now, of course, I mean, Australia is uh, a globally focused uh, open trading economy. Uh, we want to ensure that uh, our exporting businesses can sell as many Australian products and services all around the world, including and in particular our agricultural sector, which sells our uh, amazing agricultural produce into markets all around the world. Uh, so, of course, we uh, continue to engage uh, with uh, our trading partners around the world, and we are also uh, an economy which relies on foreign investment to meet uh, its, uh, to reach its full potential. And we have a very sophisticated foreign investment review framework in place which uh, ensures that any foreign investment uh, that does uh, come into Australia is not contrary uh, to our national interest. So the Australian people can have confidence that uh, through the measures that we have uh, taken, but governments of both persuasions in recent decades, but the measures that we are taking as we speak right now, uh, the Australian government is uh, taking steps to ensure that internationally uh, Australia speaks with one voice when it comes to standing up for our national interests. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, your government has been hell bent on foreign investment purporting it is in Australia's best interest. Please explain how approximately 700 multinational companies in Australia with a total combined turnover in the hundreds of billions of dollars only pay on average a combined $14 billion a year or 4% of the total income tax collected in Australia is in our best interest. Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson for that supplementary. Uh, the Australian government is hell-bent on maximising the opportunity for Australians today and into the future to get ahead. Uh, and that is why we are committed uh, to uh, a set of policies and initiatives that maximise our economic growth opportunities, that maximise investment into our future growth, that maximise the opportunity for Australian businesses to be successful and hire more Australians, creating more jobs. Any business that operates in the Australian economy, of course, has to comply uh, with our laws, including and in particular our tax laws. Our government uh, has a proud record when it comes to making sure that multinational businesses operating in Australia comply with our tax laws. We have one of the toughest uh, multinational tax, uh, anti-tax avoidance uh, regimes in place in the world. We, of course, have worked with our international partners through the G20 and, uh, you know, to implement all of the recommendations of the uh, base erosion and profit shifting uh, action plan. Uh, we, we have one of the toughest anti-avoidance regimes Coleman. in the world. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Well, Minister, is it true that we collect approximately $400 million from our gas fields off the northwest shelf in Western Australia, yet their export value is approximately $54 billion a year? Again, where is this in Australia's best interest? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Australia does uh, draw a lot of benefit. Uh, from uh, our exporting activities, including and in particular uh, the export of uh, uh, our oil and gas resources. It generates a lot of jobs for Australians. It generates a, a lot of uh, trading opportunities. And of course, all these, all these businesses have to comply with our tax laws. And company tax in Australia is paid on profits. It's paid on profits. It's not paid on income, it's paid on profits. And uh, businesses with a large turnover uh, have to pay 30% a tax on their profits, and that is, of course, uh, what all businesses across all sectors uh, have to do. Senator McLaughlin. President, my question is for the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Yeah, yeah. Can the Minister outline how the Morrison government is updating defence's strategic policy and sharpening its capability to protect Australia and its interests? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for that question and for his support for defence industry in particular. The first role of the Australian government is to keep Australia and all Australians safe. The stark fact is that today, though, at the same time we are facing a, in, uh, a, a pandemic-induced economic shock, our region is facing the most consequential strategic realignment since the end of World War II. Our national interests are being challenged more directly 
and therefore we are demanding and we need a clear-eyed prioritisation of our defence forces. This is why, on my appointment as the Minister for Defence, I set three priorities for the defence portfolio—strategy, capability and reform. The 2020 Defence Strategic Update and accompanying force structure plan are timely, comprehensive and have been well received. These documents addressed my first two priorities, strategy and also capability. They demonstrate that defence thinking and planning have shifted gears in response to the changes in our strategic environment. I've set three new military effects-based strategic objectives for defence. The first is to shape our strategic environment. The second is to deter actions against Australian interests. And thirdly, is to be able to respond with credible credible military force when required. This government's clear-eyed approach demonstrates to Australians that their security and also their prosperity are our first priority. In relation to my third priority, and that is reform, defence must continue to adapt and transform to ensure that we align strategy, capability with our financial resources. And I will be making further announcements on the direction of that transformational work later this year. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise how the government is providing funding certainty to defence over the decade ahead? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President. Over the next decade, this government has committed $270 billion in defence capability. This will transform Army, Air Force and Navy. And it develops two new military capability domains, one of space and the second information and cyber. This locks in our long-term funding commitment that we made in the 2016 White Paper. This unequivocally maintains long-term certainty for defence spending. Both defence and Australian defence industry rely on this funding stability, especially during this particularly challenging time for our economy. This financial year, as promised, we will meet 2 per cent of GDP, and we've also decoupled defence funding from GDP. On this side of the chamber, we have delivered the right defence strategy for our nation, and we have ensured it is funded. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Minister, how is the government supporting Australia's defence industry and its workers through these investments? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, to deliver the force structure plan, this government understands we need strong and enduring partnerships with Australian industry. And I am very proud to be part of a government that has unashamedly backed in Australian defence industry and the capability of Australian workers. The vast majority of the defence budget is spent right here in Australia. 32 per cent on salaries of over 116,000 Australian personnel, 30 per cent on sustainment, which is mostly spent right here across Australia, and 34 per cent investment in new capability, which increasingly, as a result of our government's very deliberate policies, is being spent here in Australian industry. Over 15,000 Australian companies and 70,000 Australians are now benefiting directly from our investment in defence. And that number is growing Order. rapidly Senator even Reynolds, during the COVID time for the, the answer COVID has expired. Period. We're going for the online trifecta today. Um, Senator Rice. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Last week, the federal court gave final orders in its judgment of illegal logging by Vic Forests, which took place under the Commonwealth State Regional Forest Agreements. The court found that logging damages or destroys habitat critical to the survival of the critically endangered leadbeater's possums and the threatened greater gliders, and awarded costs against Vic Forests. More federal court order, action order. Also Sorry, Senator Rice, up. please stop. I, I, I have asked before when we're hearing questions online that we um, have it in dead silence so we can all hear it. Please continue, Senator Rice. Thank you. More federal court action was also launched last week, including against the Commonwealth, by the Bob Brown Foundation against logging in Tasmania on the grounds that the Tasmanian order Regional Forest right. Agreement does not have enforceable environmental protections that are required under the RFA Act. 
What action is the government planning on taking against this illegal logging? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks very much, uh, Mr. President. I, uh, I, thank, uh, I thank the senator for her question. Um, I, uh, I don't necessarily accept all of the uh, arguments or statements or claims that have been made by the senator in her question. My uh, understanding is that uh, yes, the federal court made final orders on Friday, the 21st of August, following the judgment that was handed down in Friends of the Leadbeater's Possum v Vic Forest. Uh, which was handed down on 27 May of this year. Uh, the government is carefully considering uh, this judgment uh, and its implications. Uh, I understand uh, other proceedings, as the senator referenced, were filed by the Bob Brown Foundation in relation to, uh, to these, uh, these matters. I, uh, I, I hear some of the commentary from uh, other colleagues uh, on this matter, and indeed it, uh, it would be of no surprise that, uh, that the Bob Brown Foundation uh, would indeed seek to disrupt any or all such activities that it could possibly find a means to disrupt, uh, and that, uh, that indeed a constant challenge in some of these areas uh, are those who seek to use every possible means uh, to delay, to defer, uh, whether or not the legal grounds are there, uh, but to ensure that the costs of proceeding with certain activities uh, is ever greater. Now, in the end, it's crucial, it's crucial, Mr. President, and that we have appropriate laws in place for the protection uh, of the environment, but also for va valuable economic activities like forestry to be able to be uh, undertaken and provide the types of jobs, security and opportunities that they do in communities around the country. Uh, and our government is determined to make sure those frameworks work and uh, work for those communities work for the environment and work to preserve the jobs of those who rely upon them. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Yes. Um, Minister, given the failure of state governments to protect forests and threaten wildlife under the regional forest agreements, why is the government planning on handing over more power to the states, taking a chainsaw to our environment laws and slashing environmental protections in their changes to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Well, I don't accept anything in uh, in terms of the approach there that uh, that, uh, that Senator Rice has uh, has said. The government is by no means by no means taking a chainsaw to uh, to any environmental regulation or protection. But we are certainly we are going to certainly do our best to take a chainsaw to delays and to red tape and to additional costs and to make sure that when environmental regulation is applied in Australia. It is applied for the protection of the environment, not for the delay, the deferral or applying additional costs onto viable economic activity and business activity. We want to see projects that can coexist with the environment go ahead without spending years in multiple duplicative approval processes. We want to make sure that those sorts of projects can actually happen and employ and create jobs for Australians without facing undue costs, unnecessary Order, impositions, and that's why we're we'll with states to do just expired. that. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Yes, Minister, what does the government then say to the people of Australia who not only have seen illegal logging, but have saw over three billion animals killed by last summer's climate crisis fueled bushfires, who want stronger laws to protect our forests and animals rather than having their very existence left to the mercy of big miners, developers and logging companies. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Uh, Senator Rice is seeking to wrap up every single one of the Greens' primary headline-grabbing grievances uh, in one supplementary question there. Now, the truth, Mr President, the truth is that there are much more complicated issues at play when it comes to fire management, to forestry management, to natural resource management, uh, than the way in which Senator Rice seeks to summarise it. That's why our government supported and drove the delivery of a royal commission into bushfires, which I have no doubt, when it hands down its findings, will demonstrate the complexity of the issues there in relation to bush management and to making sure that the nation is better equipped when it comes to bushfires in the future to prevent them. And there will be a range of land management questions and issues 
addressed in that report, and we will no doubt then work through and respond effectively to those issues. But to simply summarise it in the way in which Senator Rice does, which seems to suggest that just locking up more land would somehow Order, avoid bushfires, is clearly, clearly against expired. the facts of the Senator Polly. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Yeah, yeah. On the 11th of March, the minister said in a media release that the Morrison government would, and I quote, support aged care providers with personal protection protective equipment, resources for staff where it is needed as part of the infection control measures. The Royal Commission heard evidence that aged care workers were told they could only use two masks per shift and only one glove. How did the minister allow this to happen? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, the press the release that um, Senator Polly refers to relates to our provision of PPE uh, and surge workforce into residential aged care facilities that have had a COVID-19 outbreak. And that's exactly what we did. So, Mr President, every aged care facility uh, that has had a COVID outbreak, Order. outbreak has, has had a provision of, uh, has had provision of uh, PPE provided to it. Uh, to, and, and in fact, if you go back to that point in time, Mr. President, Pratt, if you go back to, to that point in time, Mr. President, you will you will note that there was a global shortage of PPE at that point in time, and this government has built a significant, Mr. President, a significant stockpile of COVID order. Uh, of uh, PPE to or provide I've, I've to Wong residential on, aged I've care Senator providers. Wong on a point of order, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Direct relevance. There, there was a direct question about two masks per shift. And only one, or only one glove. It's reasonable, I think, for Australians to know why that occurred on this minister's watch. I'd ask him to respond to that aspect of the question. Senator Cormann, on the point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. There was way more uh, to that question, and the minister could not have been more directly relevant to the question if he had tried. Um, uh, in my, in listening carefully to the answer, the minister is talking about personal protective equipment and its provision, which is directly relevant to the question. There's an opportunity to debate questions after question time, but the minister is being directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. So, In every circumstance of a COVID-19 outbreak, uh, the assessment of the first responder goes in and, and looks at the uh, stocks of PPE in the, in the facility to ensure that they are, are adequate and, and to ensure that, pro well, Mr President, uh, uh, too late then is the call, Mr. President. All providers are required under the Act to have Order. adequate stocks of PPE, Mr. Order President. On my that, is their, that is their responsibility. So the Order. providers in that circumstance, Mr. President, need to step up. Mr. President, but Senator, in every Senator Pratt, in I've every circumstance order three times where there's been an this outbreak answer. of COVID-19, one of the things that we have made sure, Mr. President, is that they have availability of PPE because Senator it is McAllister. absolutely critical, Mr President. Senator PPE Watt. is critical in managing a COVID-19 outbreak Senator within Watt, a facility. On a point of order. Point of order direct relevance. Two masks per shift or one glove. Why? Senator Wong, that was part of the question. The minister is talking about the provision and requirement for this equipment. I, I hold that he is directly relevant. There is an opportunity to debate it after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. So, in every circumstance where there's been an outbreak of COVID-19, we have ensured that there is adequate supplies of PPE Order. into the facilities. That has been part of the work that our case managers have done on a daily basis, Mr. President, to ensure that infection control can be managed within facilities. Senator Order. Senator Polly is on her feet. Senator Polly is on her feet. Senator Polly, a supplementary question. Senator Griff asked the minister. How much of the $205 million committed in May for staffing, training and PPE was actually spent on those items? Can the minister now answer that question and can he confirm this $205 million was paid as a supplement and no conditions were imposed on the spending of the money? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Polly, for the question. Uh, and as I said to uh, Senator Griff uh, earlier in the week, uh, that there will be reporting on that funding that was applied by the, the uh, two aged care providers, and it will be provided in their annual reconciliation, Mr. President, which is publicly reported. Which is publicly reported. 
So when that when that uh, reconciliation comes in, Mr. President, it'll be uh, it'll be reported to the Aged Care Finance Authority, and it will be publicly reported. It'll be available for anyone to have a look at, uh, Mr. President. So uh, we we provided additional order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Mr. President, this direct relevance. He's had 24 hours to get this information. He might try and fob it off that there's an annual reconciliation. People are dying. A reasonable question about PPE has been asked. I'd ask the minister to answer well, it. Senator he can Wong, hide behind you, you procedures, can, you, Mr. Senator, President, but this is an important order, question. Senator Wong, um, Senator Cormann, on the point on of the order. Point of order. Uh, Senator Wong, in raising this point of order, is completely disregarding your previous ruling, and she is even interjecting as I am taking a point of order. Mr. President, Mr. President, as uh, presidents. Uh, before you, including President Hogg, have said often, uh, you can ask the question, you can require it to be directly relevant, you can't actually provide the answer yourself. Like if you want to take note of the answer, there's a time after question time to do so. Um, on the point of order, the minister is talk. I'll rule when there's silence. The minister is talking about the matter raised in the question, i.e. the supplement. I cannot instruct him how to answer a question. There's an opportunity afterwards to, to debate answers, but he is being directly relevant to the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. So, as I said, was saying, Mr. President, uh, all providers are required to uh, lodge annual returns. There are conditions on those annual returns, Mr. President, uh, and so that information will be available once those annual returns are submitted. Senator Polly, order. Order. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Melbourne aged care worker Lena has said that infection bags filled with contaminated PPE were sitting in a big pile so high it was literally up to the neighbour's fence line. Why has the minister still failed to ensure workers and residents have the protection they needed and deserve? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, uh, the issue of waste PPE in Melbourne over the last four weeks has been quite a considerable one, Mr. President. Uh, if you consider that an aged care facility with a COVID outbreak produces something in the order of six cubic metres of PPE waste per day, uh, that creates a, quite a significant problem. But one of the really good things that's occurred through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre has been able to manage the waste. We actually, during that period of time, had a breakdown in one of the incinerators was, that was disposing of the waste of PPE in Victoria, and we also had some regulatory problems, Mr. Mr. President, uh, in in having enough Order heavy vehicles that were licensed to be able to move the PPE away, Mr. President. But those things have all been worked through through the auspices of the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre. So, Mr. President, it may very well have been that a, a nurse saw large piles of waste PPE outside a facility. The COVID-19 outbreak the creates considerable has waste. Expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, this week is the 10th National Skills Week, a week dedicated to raising the profile and status of vocational learning, dispelling outdated myths and showcasing the attractive career opportunities for all Australians. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's skills reform agenda has strengthened our vocational and education system? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, thank you very much. And I acknowledge uh, the strong interest that Senator O'Sullivan has had uh, in vocational education and training uh, throughout his career. But it is National Skills Week this week, and it is the 10th National Skills Week, and uh, we are certainly celebrating uh, what vocational education and training is able to offer to Australians. But, Mr. President, in particular now with the impact of COVID-19, both here in Australia. Uh, but globally, what we've seen is the acceleration in the change in the nature of work. What we are very much focused on now as a government is that our capacity to grow, to thrive uh, and to create more jobs is very much dependent on employers and individuals, regardless of their background, regardless of their circumstances, being able to access the right skills at the right time. And that is exactly what a strong vocational education and training sector uh, can do for Australians. Mr President, the government understands the key role that vocational education and training 
plays in delivering Australians with the right skills for employers. And that is why, as a government, colleagues, we are investing a record $6.5 billion. I'll just say that again for the benefit of those on the other side. The Morrison government is investing a record $6.5 billion in our schools system. Mr President, we know that you need to reform the schools system in Australia. The mess that those on the other side left, and I will address that in future questions, uh, is still being paid for by Australians. That is why we are investing an additional $6.5 billion in skills reform across Australia. And in particular, we are focusing on wage subsidies so that small and medium businesses across Australia are able to keep their apprentices and trainees in training. We're also looking at ensuring that our skills sector responds properly to areas of Order. demand. Order. Senator Cash. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, following the government's successful and, might I add, uh, swift negotiation of a new Heads of Agreement for National Skills Funding and Reform, what will the government's further reform priorities to support job creation and a skilled Australia deliver? Senator Cash. Well, well, Mr President, in addition to investing a record $6.5 billion in our skills system, what Senator Watt does not appreciate is that the greatest fall in apprentice numbers on record occurred, colleagues, 2012-13, when they fell, Senator Watt, by 110,000 or 22 per cent. That was under Senator Watt, the former Labor government. In addition, over two years, Senator Watt, the former Labor government gutted $1.2 billion from employer incentives. They were not incentivised to take on apprentices because you gutted the system. Since we have been in office, we have progressively reformed vocational education and training in Australia. As I said, we are investing now a record $6.5 billion in our school system. And that includes getting rid of Labor's NASWAD, the National Agreement on Skills and Workforce Development, and replacing Order, it with Senator a Cash, new time funding for the agreement. Has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr President. I thank the minister for that answer. Minister, can you please update the Senate on the government's supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy Senator Cash. and how this program Sorry. is preserving our skilled workforce through the economic impacts of COVID-19? My thank apologies, Mr. Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. What the government is doing, and in particular as a result of COVID-19, because we do know that apprentices and trainees are affected uh, when there is a downturn in the economy, we've put in place a $2.8 billion supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. Uh, we're extending the subsidy to apprentices employed by medium businesses. Well, initially it was focused on small businesses. We're now extending it to medium businesses in Australia. The extended wage subsidy will now support its around 90,000 businesses employing around 180,000 apprentices. And in fact, Mr President, to date, or as at the 21st of August, the program has supported around 50,700 businesses to retain over 88,000 apprentices. And this is despite the impact that COVID-19 is having on the economy. And in fact, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, in the state of Western Australia, 6,227 apprentices and trainees are currently being supported by uh, the $2.8 billion Order, wage subsidy Senator that Cash. we put in place. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Given the multiple warnings, including the interim report of the Royal Commission entitled Neglect, warnings from the Northern Hemisphere, warnings from experts and unions, and the warnings presented by Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and Newmarch House in April, how could Mr Morrison possibly claim on the 29th of July that the risks to aged care couldn't be, and I quote, anticipated or foreshadowed. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In fact, uh, the uh, report of New, uh, to Newmarch Lodge uh, that we released last week uh, also stated that some of the risks and some of the events that had occurred couldn't have been anticipated. So it's not just Mr Morrison or 
the government saying those things. That was actually part of the report that was conducted into New March. Uh, that is a pretty low thing to say, Senator Gallagher. That is a pretty low. So, so you want to cast a slur on the health professionals who do a professional report into Newmarch Lodge? I reckon that's a pretty low thing to do, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, all through, all through, all through this pandemic, Mr. President, what this government has done has taken the advice of the, of the health experts, the the chief medical officer, uh, the chief health officer of each officers of each state, the deputy health officers. Uh, Chief Medi De Deputy, Deputy Chief Medical Officers uh, and all of the officials who have provided us with medical advice through this pandemic. Uh, and we have based our actions on the advice of those medical professions, mis professionals, Mr. President. All of them. The, the, the initial work that was done through the national COVID-19 health response, which pulled together the hospitals agreements that provided support particularly in Victoria when things got really bad there, both in the context of places for people to go but also for surge workforce. Uh, the guidance of the CDNA, Mr President, who provided uh, comprehensive work and guidance to the aged care sector with respect to infection control and management. All of those things combined, Mr President, uh, were where we acted based on the advice of those, uh, those health professionals who put us in the best position possible to manage our way through the COVID-19 pandemic. Order. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Despite claiming, this minister claiming that he's responded incredibly well, that we're extremely fortunate and that the government's response is a high watermark, this minister has failed to give one example of action not discussion, not talking, but action he's taken in response to warning after warning after warning. Don't the 200,000 Australians in aged care deserve a minister who will get it right and take real action instead of endless talk fests and self-congratulation? Thank you, Mr President. Again, the opposition take words that have been used by me and put them in a different form to some sort of uh, their, their, their own political purpose, Mr President. Uh, and, 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 quite frankly, the dishonesty of the Labor Party, who continue to misuse and misrepresent my words, uh, becomes, becomes a bit tiring, Mr. President. Uh, it is clear, Mr. President, that we have continued to act on the advice of those health professionals who have guided us all the way through this COVID-19 pandemic. And I have seen, Mr. President, every day, uh, work, working and talking to the case managers. That, uh, that are looking after each of the facilities that have a COVID-19 outbreak, acting on the learnings from previous experience, uh, ensuring that uh, capacity is available. And we have continued, as I've said a number of times, to build the capacity that we required, whether that be in waste management, whether that be surge workforce, whether Order, that Senator be hospital Colbeck, capacity. Time for the answers expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Given this morning not one of the minister's colleagues rose to their feet in his defence, Given that Mr Morrison has sidelined him from decisions in his own portfolio, and given that the Prime Order. Minister has handballed defence of him to, the, to Minister Hunt in the House of Representatives in question time today, can he explain why older Australians should have to wait for a reshuffle before they get a minister who's capable of getting it right? Senator Colbeck. Mr President. As I said this morning, the thing that I have not done through this debate is, uh, and through this pandemic is attempt to play politics with it like Labor has. I have, I have spoken at every, at every turn to, to my shadow uh, and, and answered her, her questions and provided information to her and, to be frank, Mr President, not, and not received much advice that's of use, Mr President. I have rung Mr. President, Order. I have rung Labor members of Parliament. I have Order. rung Labor members of Parliament to provide Order them advice left. and provide them information with respect to outbreaks in their seats. I have escalated the issues that they have brought to me to ensure that their constituents were properly looked after as part of the way that we deal with this pandemic, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, I, I, I will not 
be verbal by Labor. I will not have my words misrepresented by Order, the Mr. Senator President. Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on her recent meeting with international counterparts and how Australia's approach to the COVID-19 pandemic compares to other countries? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Askew, for, for the question. Um, around uh, a really important meeting that I held um, during this week. Um, internationally, um, I uh, have been speaking with a number of my counterparts overseas. Uh, but this week I actually spoke to my social services colleagues in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand so that we could discuss our social policy responses to this once-in-a-generation, once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-century coronavirus pandemic. Um, I must say that it was tremendously informative and productive to be able to discuss um, the, on the issues that are temporarily facing just about every country in the world and to speak to them about the plans that they have employed to date and plans that they intend to employ going forward. Because, of course, as we come out of the, um, the health crisis, we now have to work about how we are going to recover from this pandemic and transition to what will be a new normal. We're all facing shared challenges, uh, and all ministers uh, said that whilst our primary focus had been, of course, to put things in place as quickly as possible to address the needs of people, um, now is the time for us to start discussing how we might assist our countries and the people in our countries um, to be able to get back onto the other side, to how to get our workforces back stood up again, but at the same time making sure that we continue to support the people of our countries. The United Kingdom uh, and the United States have very much focused their packages so far on supporting people um, in employment situations and making sure that they retain their connection to the workplace. Um, likewise, in Australia, but also in Canada and New Zealand, we've coupled that with not just working with people in the workforce, but making sure that we put supports, additional supports in place for people who find themselves without of work. Um, given the fact that this pandemic has affected just well, every country in the world, we thought it was very important that we shared experiences so that we can hopefully get through this pandemic Order, better. Senator Rustin. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise the Senate of what transitional support arrangements are in place in other countries? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, all ministers at the meeting are currently um, grappling with the transition phase and how they will deal with the support packages that are in place and how best they can reopen their economies, support people who continue to be impacted by this pandemic through hardship and to ensure that we maintain a control of the spread of the virus. Amongst our international peers, Australia is regarded as extraordinarily highly. Uh, and they were all very interested to learn that we'd made the decision that we would extend the level of support, additional support that we are putting in place for people who are unemployed, but in addition that the JobKeeper payments were going to be continued out until March. Canada advised that their emergency response benefit is set to end in October and their emergency wage subsidy will finish in December. New Zealand announced that their income relief payments will end in November and their wage subsidies in September. The UK uh, job retention and income supports will end in October, and the United States announced that all their measures were set to end on the 31st of December. Order. Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. How will you continue to work with your international colleagues as the world manages the COVID-19 crisis? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, we will continue to work together. We will continue to share ideas with other countries as we move into the recovery phase. And at the meeting, we all agreed that we would continue to share information that is critical for all of us in our ongoing recovery, the world's recovery and our individual countries' recovery from COVID-19. Uh, in addition, our officials will have agreed to continue to meet on a regular basis and to work through the challenges and discuss how we might plan to overcome them and make sure that we're learning from each other. Um, because clearly, learning from each other will also um, offer the opportunity for us to be able to share with other countries the learnings that we've found here in Australia to be helpful to us. We are committed to continue to monitor the situation uh, as it unfolds because we know that the best way to be able to respond to this is to remain extraordinarily agile. I have agreed to continue on a regular basis to meet with my international colleagues, and can I please put on the record my thanks to Ministers Hagen, Davies, 
Poisson and Cepaloni for taking the time to partake in these valuable discussions. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Senator Payne. Mr. President, uh, I have uh, some further information to add in response to uh, Senator Steele John's earlier question uh, in question time. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, I can advise that the government is currently, uh, as I think I adverted to in my response, considering the request made by the Chair of the Disability Royal Commission for amendments to the Royal Commission's Act 1902. Uh, this is an important issue and it is being given careful and detailed consideration by government, as uh, you would expect. And, and so I do um, not, uh, not uh, support Senator Steeljohn's suggestion that the Attorney General should apologise in this context because it is under active consideration. I think it is also important to highlight, Madam Deputy President, that uh, information provided to a Royal Commission is already protected during the terms of the Commission. There are already several ways that a Royal Commission can protect the information provided and the identity of these people. For example, through the use of private sessions or pseudonyms or the making of do not publish orders. Any information provided to the Royal Commission in connection with or during a private session is protected from disclosure by law, uh, even after the inquiry has uh, ended. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, noting the matters that uh, Senator Steele-John uh, raised, if there is anything further I can add in, uh, in another response uh, after it has been considered by the Attorney General, I will do so. Thank you, Minister. So the question is: Are there any? I oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Colbert. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I have some further information with respect to Kalinia Care from that I uh, said I'd bring back to the chamber. So, Mr. President, uh, the department and the local PHU were notified of the outbreak at uh, Kalinia Care on the 27th of July, Mr. President. Um, as I said in my answer, the the facility was primarily staffed by the provider until uh, we brought in uh, workforce uh, on, from the 1st of August. Uh, we had uh, sonic testing staff, uh, testing staff and residents on site from the 28th of July. Mr. President, uh, between the 27th of July and the 31st of July, nine staff tested positive, uh, but no residents. The first resident to test positive at Kalinia Care tested positive on the 1st of August. Thank you, Minister. So the question is, uh, oh, Senator, Watt. Uh, yes, are there any motions to take note of answers? No, 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 no. I beg your pardon. Sorry. If to take note of the minister's statement. Is leave granted? Yep. I believe leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Watt. Leave uh, is granted for one minute. Okay. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, again, we've had the embarrassing situation where the minister has had to come back to the chamber to give basic details that he was unaware of during question time today. But more importantly, uh, in the minister's presentation during question time, again, completely unable to give any explanation for why aged care workers were left without adequate PPE. Uh, we have had reports to the Royal Commission, the government's own Royal Commission, that aged care workers were left with only one glove and only two face masks. And the incredible admission from the minister that the government only thought about ensuring that aged care facilities had adequate PPE after an outbreak had occurred. The entire point of PPE is to keep an outbreak out of an aged care facility. It's too late once it's got into a facility. And if you're then leaving staff with only one glove and, and two face masks, that's only going to make the situ situation worse. Again, Thank the government you, has Senator failed. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. So I'm going to move to motions to take notes. So are there any motions to take note of answers? Uh, Senator Billick. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Labor senators. I've got a mum who's 90 years old. 90. She had a birthday on the 8th of August. Thankfully, she's in relatively good health, considering her age, and she lives independently. Because I'm telling you, I would move hell and high water if she, if she had to go into, into an aged care facility. I, I would not be having that because I do not feel that I do not have any confidence in what this government does in aged care, and it's not just in relation to COVID. 
as bad as that's been, as, as embarrassing as that's been, as much as it's shown what a lazy government we have and how they don't actually take any uh, uh, respect for our elders. They don't care. They, they don't care about what happens to older Australians. You know, aged care isn't even in cabinet. Um, and Cabinet hasn't even been briefed. So, as far as I'm concerned, that tells us a whole lot about what this government thinks and how they treat um, elderly Australians. But I don't trust that the minister has the competence to manage, as I say, not only the COVID-19 um, outbreak, but I don't trust him to run the system uh, more generally. This is a minister who can't answer basic questions, basic questions about COVID-19 outbreak in uh, aged care. He couldn't tell the COVID-19 Senate committee how many people had died in aged care, and he stumbled over this figure when responding to me in question time earlier in the week on Monday. He couldn't say whether he'd briefed the Federal Cabinet on the interim report of the Aged Care Royal Commission. And yesterday he scurried from the Senate while Labor senators responded to his weak defence of the government's record on aged care. Today, today he couldn't tell us how much of the $205 million committed in May for staffing, training and PPE was actually spent on those items. And he couldn't tell us what conditions were imposed on the spending of that money. Now, this is not a minister that is on top of his game. This is the most critical issue in Australian history in the last 100 years. It's not like it's just a, a little one-off episode that you know, some, someone caught you know, a disease. This is affecting the whole of the Australian nation. It's put people out of work. It's stopped people being able, to get children being able to go to school. It's put um, cities and, and regions into lockdown. And he's the minister responsible for aged care, and he can't answer these basic questions. I'll tell you what we can do. Earlier today, Minister, uh, Mr Albanese gave a speech at the National Press Club. And seeing as how this government—it was a very good speech, Senator Farrell, I agree—seeing as how this government has absolutely no idea on how to deal with any of the issues in aged care, um, the Labor Party will once again, once again make some suggestions to them on what they can do. And Mr Albanese spoke today, as I said, in the National Press Club, and he pointed out that in the absence of a government plan, there are eight points the government could consider. And this is, once again, Labor having to do the work of the government because they are so inept, they are so incompetent that they can't actually work out what they need to do. So what did Mr Albanese suggest? Well, pretty basic stuff. Minimum staffing levels in residential aged care. Reduce the home care package waiting list so more people can stay in their homes. And that does remind me about a survey. That point reminds me about a survey showing that Australians have lost confidence in the system under this government. A survey by Fifth Dimension found that 54 per cent of people with family members in aged care are thinking of moving their loved ones into their own homes. And this survey was conducted between July the 31st and August the 3rd after the deadly outbreak of coronavirus in nursing homes in Sydney and Melbourne. And of these, a third are considering to do that so permanently. Now, you know, that might actually solve a bit of the problem for the aged care facilities, but it opens up a whole other problem for the government because they've got over 100, I think it might be 130,000 people on the waiting list for home care packages. And if these people are moved out, then it's, it's a hell of a lot more um, home care packages that people will be waiting for. So the third point that, um, Minister Albanese, uh, that Mr Albanese talked about was to ensure transparency and accountability of funding to support high quality care. And I've got to Thank say, you, I'm Senator Billick, your time has expired. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy. Sorry, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to address this question because it is important. And as Senator Billick said, there are people around the nation who are concerned about older Australians in this COVID um, pandemic. The pleasing thing to report is that, uh, amongst aged care recipients in the ACT, there have been no cases 
in the Northern Territory, no cases. In Queensland, one. In South Australia, none. In Tasmania, one. In West Australia, none. Uh, New South Wales has had more. Um, and Victoria clearly has a high caseload. But it's important to note that of um, 208 residential services uh, where there have been outbreaks, 183 of them, the vast majority, have been in Victoria, and 97 per cent nationally have had no outbreak. Now, why is that important in the context of this discussion? Uh, Senator Polly highlighted during her uh, contribution a concern that a nurse saw piles of PPE in rubbish bags out the back of an aged care home. And what that points to is that PPE was provided, and the fact that there were piles of it means it was provided in quantity, and importantly, the staff were obviously following the protocols which required frequent changing of the PPE. And so there's actually a contradiction in the argument, because what their own comments have highlighted is that PPE in quantity was provided and that training was adequate, that people were following the procedures, and what was an issue here was the waste removal service. The other point I would make when it comes to understanding the importance of the size of the community outbreak is to look at the hospitals uh, and healthcare workers in Victoria. The state chief health officer in Victoria has now conceded that the majority of healthcare workers who have been infected with COVID-19 have been infected in the workplace. So while in Australia, nationwide, uh, there's 1,817 aged care residents who have contracted COVID, there are 2,563 healthcare workers in Victoria who have contracted COVID. And so we're talking here about a younger, better trained, better equipped population of Australians in Victoria who have contracted COVID. So these are people in professional healthcare environments who've been provided with PPE in accordance with the state government and the health department requirements, who've received training, who have the backup staff that when people have to self-isolate, and there's a, a large caseload of health workers who have been fronting up day after day and then having to go into isolation uh, when other colleagues have become infected. But even in that workplace, we see a high rate of infection. And what that points to is that COVID-19 is a highly infectious disease, and when you have a high degree of community transmission, even the best of protocols and the best of procedures in a healthcare environment have not stopped 2,563 professional healthcare workers in the Victorian health system contracting COVID. And so to attack the Minister for Aged Care for the outcomes that we're seeing in aged care homes neglects the fact that there is a higher caseload of infection amongst professional health workers who have all the PPE they need, follow the protocols, and that's because of the infectious nature of the disease. If you go to the Centre Disease Control Guidelines out of the United States, uh, a biological safety level ranging from one to four is assigned to various degrees. And for an airborne transmissional disease like COVID-19, it's normally assigned a biosafety level three or a BSL three. Uh, they say for testing, you could perhaps roll that back to two. But in an environment where aerosols are being created because of the interaction between people, it is a highly infectious environment. And where community transmission has been allowed to grow to such a size, the situation in the health environment in Victoria shows that the aged care system uh, nationwide Thank you, is Fawcett. doing well. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Your time has expired. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, in my question to the Minister for Ageing today, Minister Colbeck, we saw him again fail to say exactly what it is that he did not get right. 
So how can we know he's fixed it if he can't even say what he didn't get right? Now he's admitted, he realised he didn't get it right in the experience of St Basil's, but that was months after the experience at Dorothy Henderson Lodge, and it was months after Newmarch House. And even still, he says he's having conversations. But this week, he hasn't been able to point to one action he's taken in response to warnings. He's referred to conversations, to talking, to letters, to webinars. Well, older Australians need a minister who will hear the warnings, who will take real action, who will get it right and will protect the 200,000 Australians in aged care. We also saw in the minister's response to my question more self-congratulation. And when I used direct quotes from the minister, he said I was doing so dishonestly. Well, these were your quotes, minister. They were your quotes. And I didn't use them dishonestly. I used your words about these exact issues. It may be difficult for you to hear, but they were your words. And this morning, you walked away from scrutiny again. You turned your back on this chamber and walked out on an issue you know is so critical, not just to the people in here, but to the people out there, to everyone with a parent in aged care, whether they've lost them or not, because everybody is scared about what's happening in Victoria. They are terrified about what could be coming to them because they have a minister and a prime minister who don't act, and by not acting, how can they conclude anything other than that you don't care enough? Because you had warnings and you failed to heed them time and time again. And not just during this pandemic. How many reports have sat on your shelves gathering dust? The warnings existed before the pandemic. They continued to flow during the pandemic, and you let your hubris get in the way of action. And that is unacceptable. It is unacceptable for the families who have lost loved ones and lost them in the loneliest of ways. God forbid we ever have to say goodbye to our parents or our spouses or the people we love like that over FaceTime, not being able to hold their hand. It is disgraceful. And self-congratulation doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. It's not acceptable. You could have fixed the issues with PPE, and instead we saw health workers with one glove. Just let that image sink in for a moment. One glove. What kind of choices are we putting these workers through? What kind of stress are we putting them through? And I reject the assertion from the ministers that we are questioning the commitment of aged care workers. Are you kidding me? Labor is standing here for aged care workers. We are standing here because we know what they are going through. They want to keep the people they care for alive, but they need support, they need help from the arm of government which is responsible for this sector. So you can save your self-congratulation, you can save the hubris, you can save the words that I quoted to you and you felt uncomfortable hearing again. I wish I didn't have to quote them to you. Wish I didn't have to ask questions. I wish we weren't sitting here holding the executive to account over this, but we are. And the least you can do is answer to this chamber. The least you can do is stay in your seat and be part of this debate instead of walk off to your office. The least you can do is listen, act, help. It's a simple thing people are asking of you. You owe that to the Australians in aged care. You owe it to every single Victorian. You owe it to every single Australian. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I've been listening very carefully to all of the speeches that have been made in this debate, but in particular to that speech that just preceded mine by Senator Smith. 
because she made a very important point in her speech but perhaps didn't realise quite the point she was making when she did so. Senator Smith said that everybody in Victoria is scared. And she's right. As a senator for Victoria and as someone who has just come here to Canberra from Victoria, there's no question. A lot of Victorians are afraid. A lot of them are scared about the impact that this virus will have on their, on their health and, indeed, the impact that the restrictions put in place to fight the virus will have on their livelihoods. But there's a clue in that observation by Senator Smith about what the problem might be here. She didn't say everybody in South Australia is scared from her home state. She didn't say everybody in New South Wales is scared, another state which has had some outbreaks, or indeed any other state or territory in the Federation. We heard a lot from Labor senators uh, this week about the responsibility that the Commonwealth Government has for regulating and funding aged care, and we absolutely accept that responsibility. But the Commonwealth has a responsibility for funding and regulating aged care in every state and territory, not just in Victoria. So what's different about the problems we're seeing in aged care in Victoria is it that the Commonwealth has decided to regulate and fund aged care in Victoria differently? Is it that they provided greater assistance to New South Wales or South Australia or any other state or territory? Or is there something different about Victoria? Clearly, there is something different about Victoria. We have widespread community transmission in Victoria. We don't have it in any other state and territory. Touch wood, I hope we never do again. But we have a very serious second wave outbreak in Victoria. And that's got nothing to do with the Commonwealth's role in regulating or funding aged care. In fact, it's got everything to do with the utter incompetence of the Victorian state government. I noticed in Senator Smith's contribution before, just as it has been the case in every other contribution made this week by Labor senators, the words the Andrews government or the Victorian government never passes their lips. Never do they point out that we have a problem in aged care in Victoria, unique so far, we hope always to be unique, in Victoria and not anywhere else in the country. They haven't shown any interest at all, have made no contributions at all about how we got to where we are in Victoria. But they should, because we've seen day by day, whether it's through the hotel quarantine inquiry, whether it's before the COVID-19 committee of this Senate, whether it's before the parliamentary inquiry happening in Victoria, that in the words of the AMA president of Victoria, the Victorian government's response to COVID-19 has been like watching a slow car crash. It has been a disastrous response. It has been a res response which has shaken the confidence of all Victorians, and unfortunately, it has been a response which has directly led to the deaths of hundreds of Victorians, including many in aged care. The Victorian government bears the responsibility for this outbreak because the Victorian government has mismanaged hotel quarantine. They've known for months, but we learned last week, that 99 per cent, at least 99 per cent, of the current outbreak in Victoria is as a result of the failure of hotel quarantine. That's a system that the Victorian government entirely devised and set up on their own. That's a system where they had offers of support from the Commonwealth in the form of ADF assistance, which they turned down and which Daniel Andrews misled the Victorian parliament about, which has been confirmed by Lieutenant General John Fruin before the COVID-19 committee. Uh, they are responsible for this outbreak. They're also responsible for their failures of tracking and tracing. Professor Brendan Murphy, our former chief health officer, now the secretary of the department, gave disturbing evidence last week to the COVID-19 committee, where he revealed the shocking failures of the tracking and tracing system in Victoria. He revealed how underutilised they were, how under-resourced under they were, uh, how they failed to use the COVID-19 app like the New South Wales government has successfully done. And he pointed out that the whole reason why this, this small leak from hotel quarantine became a massive outbreak across Victoria is because of those failures of the Victorian government. No one in this place should take any lecture seriously from any Labor senator if they fail to mention these facts. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, first of all, we're seeing you know, the federal government again trying to fail to take responsibility for, its, uh, for what's occurring regarding COVID-19 and its outbreak in the aged care sector. 
federal government has taken, failed to take responsibility in the answers that were given through their Minister Colbeck today. But what's very clear, the government has lost confidence in its strategy, its person on front point, the person responsible to turn around and make sure that aged care is properly dealt with in this country. This week, the minister was sidelined from decisions making of his own portfolio. He was excluded from decision making in the aged care emergency response. And today in the House, Mr Morrison refused on five occasions to get out of his seat and defend the minister's handling of aged care. Five occasions failed to stand by the minister who's failed in his responsibilities for aged care in this country. We then, when asked to defend the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Mr Morrison endorsed 13 ministers. Not one was Richard Colbeck. Mr Morrison has no confidence in him. Then why should Australians? He has lost his responsibility and now he should lose that title. The Morrison government, through this minister, has failed to listen to the reports that came out of the Royal Commission entitled Neglect. They failed to take action. It's okay. You hear the, when it, these, these words from the, the minister. I listened. I talked. I considered. But what is missing is action. The warnings from the Northern Hemisphere. The warnings from experts and unions. The warnings of Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and New March in April. He failed to take appropriate action and continues to take, fail to take appropriate action. And why are we in this mess? Because that failure is part of the pandemic of irresponsibility of this government when it comes to aged care. The Royal Commission into Aged Care just today received a quality uh, and safety uh, report from the University of Queensland that found of Australia's 2,700 aged care facilities, 11 per cent of Australia's 2,700 were rated as providing a high quality of care. 11 per cent were offered the worst quality care and everything in between. This government has failed to deliver a robust system. They've failed to deliver a system that can make a difference. They've tried to do it on the cheap. And why I say it's on the cheap? Because there's report after report after report saying it's on the cheap. It's estimated that they're providing highest quality of care that's found in homes with fewer residents to all 200,000 residents and facilities would cost an estimated $3.2 billion more than the $18 billion spent by the federal government on aged care in 2018. The government needs to act. We've heard numerous occasions of pandemic leave and the, the challenges with non-payment of pandemic leave. You know, we just heard we've got PPE, not for when the outbreak is about to occur, not as a risk management decision. We don't have, an, we don't have enough PPE in our aged care facilities. We don't have a plan on how to do that. We don't have a plan how to use PPE in our aged care facilities. But when there's an outbreak, don't worry, we somehow find it and rush it down when the outbreak's already occurred. That is after the event. You need to take action, not just sit back, listen, consider. I'm, I'm hearing what people are saying. It is about taking action. We've seen cases of people not receiving PPE in so many circumstances where action hasn't been taken by this government. The Health Services Union exposed recently actions that weren't taken in their industry in the aged care. And I'll just re briefly finish with this. Anne, an aged care worker, has called for the government to take action so that resident Thank aged you, care Senator workers Sheldon, are protected. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Billick to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.
Senator Seawit. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move um, to take that the chamber takes note of Green's uh, questions four and eight, and would like to hand over to Senator Steelejohn for two and a half minutes, and then to Senator Rice for two and a half minutes. Thank you. So, Senator Steelejohn. Oh, just a moment, Senator Steelejohn. We're just having trouble hearing you. Just try again. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, let us be very, very clear. The government have known uh, that there exists an impediment to disabled people, to organisations, to individuals wishing to give evidence to our Royal Commission into Disability Abuse for no less than nine months. The Chair of the Royal Commission flagged this as an issue uh, at the hearings in November. The uh, Chair subsequently wrote uh, to the government in February of this year, stating clearly that the absence of appropriate privacy protections, uh, the absence of legislative amendments to the Royal Commission Acts that would protect people's submissions, the confidentiality of those submissions beyond the life of the Royal Commission, that the absence of those amendments were an impediment to the Commission's ability to do its job. Let us be absolutely clear what the impact of the failure to act that we have seen from the government is upon people. Disabled people, having been through trauma, having been through abuse, having been subject to discrimination by their employer, by individuals, now wish to come before their Royal Commission and tell their story. And yet, in this very moment, when they should be able to feel supported to do it, they are afraid. They are afraid that should they speak, they will never work again. They are afraid that should they speak, their families will be impacted. They are afraid that should they, they speak, the situation that they find themselves in will get worse. And they are not telling their stories. They are calling hotlines run by the Royal Commission to be told, do not tell your story. Because in the absence of these amendments, it is not safe. Now, the minister says this is under consideration, that they've been looking into it. That is the same answer you gave me in estimates in February. It is not good enough for you to have been this long looking at this issue and have failed to act. If you do not introduce this legislation into the parliament, then we Greens will. Thank you, Senator Steele John, and we now go to Senator Rice. Thank you, Deputy President. The Minister's answers to my questions about illegal logging fills me with despair. And I know the people of Australia feel share that despair with me, or more than despair, anger, real anger, anger at the denial by this government, denial by the Minister that there's an issue with protecting our precious wildlife from logging. The critically endangered Leadbeater's possums, greater gliders. In Tasmania, we've got critically endangered swift parrots, wedge-tailed eagles, Tasmanian devils. And the backbench, they're just laughing at the issue, laughing at illegal logging, laughing at our precious wildlife hurtling towards extinction. And the, minister claims, the minister's claims that our laws protect the environment fly in the face of reality. They fly in the face of the federal court finding that logging is damaging and destroying habitat critical to the survival of the critically endangered leadbeater's possum. And so what are they going to do? Rather than taking action, rather than actually listening to the interim report that they commissioned from Graham Samuels into our environment laws, who told us that Australia's environment is in an unstable state of decline and under increasing threat, that our environment laws are ineffective, rather than listening and strengthening our laws, no, they moved legislation in the House today that is taking a chainsaw to our environment laws, that is going to hand over more powers to the states who have proved themselves totally incapable of protecting our environment. We need a government that's actually going to stand up for our environment, our precious forests, our precious wildlife, 
that the people of Australia really want to see protected. And they are not doing it. So I tell you, I mean, the people of Australia, if you're as angry as me, then we need to take action and we need to take it fast. We cannot let them get away with it. We cannot just allow our wildlife just to be going extinct. I mean, this government needs to hear from you and it needs to hear from you loud and clear about this trashing of our environment laws. And if they don't listen, well, then we need to get these environmental vandals out of office. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take notice of Greens questions four and eight be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.